I'm just thrilled to, um, on behalf of Andy and myself, to introduce Rachel uh, Scott this morning. The Continuum Program is designed to be a program for pre-tenure faculty uh, to discuss the interaction between faith and scholarship. So at Hope, we have an ecumenical Christian community and we desire for that to be a part of our broad conversation on campus. And so we have the opportunity to spend time with uh, Rachel and with several others uh, in our May workshop where we talk about vocation. Uh, and then we meet over the summer and we talk about the specific disciplines that each faculty member brings to the table. And then we have the opportunity for them to give these fantastic uh, lectures during our academic year. So um, I'm thrilled to introduce Rachel, Rachel Scott this morning, and I'm going to read uh, for you her vocational bio that she wrote for us as part of the May workshop. And these vocational bios are a little bit different than your standard academic bio. Um, we ask folks to talk a little bit about their own journey in faith in relationship to their scholarship. So as a way to introduce Rachel, here is her vocational bio. The daughter of a dairy farmer, Rachel Scott grew up in a small rural community in northern Michigan where the call to Christian scholarship and teaching was far from a foregone conclusion. Like many students of political science, Rachel was and is passionate about the distribution of power. She has long been curious about how human agency has created diverse systems of government, leading to systemic patterns of social and political inequality. When Rachel came to Hope College, first as an undergraduate student in 2003, she studied English, political science, and religion with the primary goal of getting into law school to work on social change as an attorney. On the eve of earning her bachelor's degree, Rachel realized she was compelled to study law, to understand causal mechanisms of human political behavior, and not to practice law. That revelation led her to Michigan State University where she earned a PhD in political science in 2015. She returned to Hope College in 2018, this time as a faculty member, after teaching at both Hunter College in New York City and Michigan State University. Here, Rachel's research focuses on Supreme Court decision making. Embedded in rational choice theory, her work seeks to explain and predict legal outcomes by examining how ju the justices of the Supreme Court strategically reach their opinions. As a teacher at Hope, Rachel is acutely aware that the marriage of Christian faith and an expression in American politics is often an uncomfortable one where faith and belief often manifest as partisan bias and difference. She feels called to follow in the footsteps of the professors that once gave her the space to question this relationship, while simultaneously teaching the tools of social science to study political behavior. Rachel believes that it is a distinct privilege to work in an institution that takes seriously the call to serve God and to serve people, providing the space to examine what it means to be a Christian political scientist. Would you please welcome with me Dr. Rachel Scott. This one? Yeah. That work? Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for that introduction, Lindsay. And thank you all for taking time out of your very busy Thursday before Thanksgiving to come and listen to me talk today. Um, when the Supreme Court is in session, the court martial announces the justices' arrival and the start of court business using the traditional cry, Oye, 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 all persons having business before the Honorable, the Supreme Court of the United States, are admonished to draw near and give their attention, for the court is now sitting. God save the United States and this Honorable Court. Today, we're going to consider together what it might mean for God to save this Honorable Court. <laughs> Specifically, I'm going to discuss the Christian call to justice and make an argument that the justices of the Supreme Court have failed to meet that standard, despite the fact that the Roberts Court has ruled in favor of religious organizations far more than any of the predecessor courts. Uh, currently, the, the Roberts Court is siding with religious organizations about 81% of the time, and those religious organizations are almost exclusively Christian organizations, including Catholic organizations. Um, and I'm going to show you a little bit of my research and how I approach the study of judicial decision making to predict where those legal outcomes are going to be. First, we're going to start with the Christian call to justice. 
There are literally hundreds of texts and verses in the Old and New Testament that speak explicitly about justice and righteousness, and hundreds more that speak to justice and righteousness implicitly. Those terms, justice and righteousness, share a lot of space in scripture. Sometimes they're used synonymously and sometimes they're used to complement one another, which suggests to me that perhaps you cannot have justice without having righteousness. Given the magnitude of data on biblical justice, to dissect and concretely define a biblical conception of justice is too tall a task for this talk. For one thing, I'm a political scientist and not a theologian, and if there are any theologians out there, I don't want you to tell me that I'm wrong. Uh, so, so I'm going to start to scratch the surface with my understanding and my grappling with what I believe the Bible teaches me about justice by first acknowledging that there is a huge diversity in scripture. Justice manifests itself differently at different times and different circumstances. When we read the Bible, we're making choices all the time, whether we're aware of it or not, about what parts of scripture apply in our modern world. Even now, I will acknowledge that I'm choosing a specific lens of interpretation by focusing on what I view to be a few key verses uh, about justice, even though I just told you that there are literally hundreds of them. So with the caveat that I know that this is overly simplistic, I do want to take a moment to set the stage and provide a frame. So first, as a Christian, I believe that our sense of justice is woven into the fabric of our very being, because we are created in the image of God, and God is justice. Take, for example, Deuteronomy uh, 32 verse 4, which says that God, the rock, is perfect, for all his ways are justice. As believers, then, we are called to emulate that justice. Over and over again, Christian calls all of creation to reconciliation and justice. Perhaps the most famous of such calls comes from Micah 6 verse 8, what I think I memorized when I was in kindergarten. What does the Lord require of you but to do justice? and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. This is a call for us individually, then, as Christians, but it also provides a really nifty analogy to our very human legal system. To tease out this analogy, we've got to start by considering what divine justice looks like. We find the word mishpat, the Hebrew word for justice, more than 200 times in the Old Testament alone. At the most basic level, according to people who read Hebrew, of which I am not one, so I'm trusting their interpretation of the word, mishpat means that people ought to be treated equitably. Regardless of social class or demographic characteristics, individuals in like cases should be treated similarly. From a criminal justice standpoint, this means that anyone who commits the same sin or violates the same law should be given the same penalty. But re retributive justice is not just about punishment. It's about rewards and redistribution, too. The biblical call to justice requires care for the vulnerable, for the widows and orphans and immigrants and the poor, for people who have had no social or political power. And scripture promises to reward those who live out this call to justice. We see this theme, this, this theme of retribution uh, over and over again in scripture, where the Bible just tells us that human deeds carry inescapable consequences. You can find evidence of this reap what you sow principle in Galatians, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, Psalms, elsewhere. The Bible even ends on this theme in Revelation 22 when God says, behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. In other words, by seeking justice and doing justice, heavenly rewards will be bestowed. Ignore the call to justice and judgment will follow, like in the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, where the rich man who ignored the call is left thirsty and tormented by flames. But thankfully for Christians, justice is not just about retaliation and punishment. Indeed, the death and resurrection of Christ is the ultimate definition or meaning of divine justice. If we take scripture as a whole, in my understanding, the meta-narrative is something like this. God created a perfect world where humans live in harmony with one another, with creation, with God, all is well and going swimmingly until humankind violated those perfect relationships with one another and with God. And this happens in Genesis 3, so we're off to a pretty rough start. 
But the rest of scripture recounts the process of restoration, which culminates with Jesus's death and resurrection, whereby the ultimate act of justice is that Jesus assumes our punishment, and we are thereby saved by grace alone. In his ministry, Jesus calls his followers to adopt this new conception of justice. Rather than poking out the eyes of our offenders, we should turn the other cheek. This is a radical upending of the Old Testament paradigm, and I don't think it supplants the retributive conception of justice, but rather makes it more dynamic. Here, we individually stand to be judged with a retributive principle. We will be judged by what we do or what we fail to do, and we will be rewarded or punished accordingly. To fully emulate Jesus, this call to justice means that we accept the punishment that our enemies or perpetrators deserve, just like Jesus did by carrying the sin for all humankind. So this is a really tough assignment for human judges, right? Those that are tasked with doling out consequences, with defining the parameters of the legal system. There's a reason that I study law and legal actors and not that I am one. That was a purposeful decision. Uh, in an essay on the function of the judiciary in 1625, Francis Bacon questioned whether human judges should imitate God in whose seat they sit. It's an instructive exercise from a normative perspective to consider how a biblical understanding of divine justice can help us evaluate human legal systems. To start, in uh, modern incarnations of legal systems, retributive justice tends to, to take center stage. That is, we create laws, and then we come up with punitive actions if someone violates those laws. But unlike the retributive justice of the Old Testament, we're not plucking out eyes and taking teeth. Instead, we're dealing with monetary fines and imprisonment. The parallel or analogy becomes pretty murky when we try to sort out what type of punishment is befitting of a criminal violation. A quick aside here is that we see a pattern among Christians, particularly of the evangelical variety, to support more punitive sentencing and harsher punishments. For example, a Pew Research Center poll um, from June of this year found that on average, 60% of American adults favor the death penalty. That jumps to almost 80% when we look at evangelicals, particularly white evangelicals. So evangelical Christians are far more likely to support um, capital punishment, um, especially con compared to the non-religious. Um, in American society, only 35% of atheists support capital punishment. And it's really striking for me to see these patterns emerge, and I could go down an entire rabbit hole, and that's not what this talk is about, but I could uh, do that because there, there are so many patterns in American public policy and public opinion that show that there seems to be a distinction of how Christians view justice particularly criminal and civil justice, relative to non-religious or other religious, uh, uh, religious traditions. And so I want to offer this as a bit of evidence to show that our understanding, our scriptural understanding of justice as depicted in the Bible has really profound consequences on our perception of how we design and implement public policy. In the American model, judges and justices at all levels of the federal and state judiciaries are imbued with the power to sentence offenders and to decide the parameters of justice. And again, we might be tempted to judge the judges and justices using a biblical standard. But we know from the outset that human judges and justices are simply not going to measure up. The Bible makes it clear that divine justice is manifest in the very character of God. And so following this logic, we can point to those characteristics normatively to evaluate our own Supreme Court justices. Take, for example, King Jehoshaphat's instructions to the judges of Judah in uh, 2 Chronicles 19, when he says, Consider what you do, for you judge not for man but for the Lord. He is with you in giving judgment. Now then, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Be careful what you do, for there is no injustice with the Lord our God, or partiality, or taking bribes. That gives us a nice tidy list. Supreme Court justices, lower court judges should all be impartial, unbiased, and incorruptible. Of course, we don't need to search long or hard to find ample evidence that judges routinely miss this mark, and it's reasonable that they do. 
For instance, humans lack the omniscience that God possesses, and therefore, inevitably, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to make tons of factual errors in understanding of particular cases, and that doesn't even touch the conscious and subconscious biasness that characterizes the human mind. Okay, so we know right off the bat that justices are going to fail to meet the biblical standard of justice by virtue of being human in a fallen world, and that, that in the world that has not been fully reconciled with its creator. But that's not the only tool or standard by which we judge our justices in the United States. In the United States, the Constitution provides another set of parameters by which to judge the courts. And for purposes of this discussion, the Constitution is at least implicitly at odds with the Christian call to justice. In case you didn't know it yet, the United States is a weird place. Uh, it's an anomaly in that we have the highest rates of religious identification and religious practice among citizens and politicians than any other Western democracy, but we also have a constitutional principle of secularization baked right into the founding document. While it's a misnomer that the words the separation of church and state appear in the Constitution, the First Amendment, which was ratified in 1789, provides a firm boundary for, for judicial interpretation by mandating that Congress shall make no law establishing, respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. We call that first part the Establishment Clause, although I think it more appropriately ought to be called the No Establishment Clause, because the first clause implies a very strict separation. Note that this prohibits the establishment of religion, not of a religion, not of a particular sect of religion, but it prohibits the establishment of religion writ large, right? The second clause, what we refer to as the free exercise clause, adds a layer of protection for those that practice a religion. On the one hand, government can't establish religion, but it also cannot unduly interfere with citizens who choose to practice religion either. Taken together, the First Amendment is a really big roadblock for those that would wish to see an explicitly Christian nation. Since its colonial inception, the United States has been a majority Christian nation. Today, about two-thirds of our population identify as Christians, which is actually the lowest rate that we've observed since pollsters started asking the question in the 1930s. At its core, the Establishment Clause blocks a religious majority from creating laws that favor its own religion. So it's this, this blockage for the majority, but the free exercise clause adds that layer of protection that the religious majority does not interfere with the religious minority either. So that's sort of a double whammy for the Christian political coalition, right? That you can't establish your own religion, but you also can't interfere with anyone else. And that's something that the Christian political coalition with the rise of, of the Christian right in particular, that's something that they've been very mobilized against visibly for the last couple of decades, and I'm going to return to that point in a bit. But when it comes to judging the courts with a scriptural lens, the second layer of constitutional complexity comes from Article 6, which prohibits a religious litmus test for public servants. Despite the lack of an official religious requirement, however, it's worth noting that fully 80% of the justices that have ever served on the Supreme Court were of various Protestant denominations, and less than 8% of justices were not Christians. They identified as Jews. We've only had one of 115 justices on the Supreme Court with whom we don't know what their religious identification was. So maybe non-religious, or we just don't know. Uh, the current court contains six Catholics, two Jews, and one Protestant, although Justice Gorsuch, the lone Episcopalian on the court, was raised as Catholic, so functionally we have seven Catholics and two Jews um, on, on, this, on the Supreme Court. Okay, so with that stage set, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here because I want to show you what my research actually looks like since this is how I spend the majority of my time. Despite that very long-winded setup um, in my, my talk, my own empirical research is not actually expressly or explicitly motivated by religion. That is, unlike some other scholars who situate their work in discovering patterns of how various religious traditions lead to different judicial outcomes, I'm interested in which players on the court have the power to pull legal policy in their preferred direction. 
Now, notably, this can and is inextricably linked to the personal policy preferences and ideology of the justices, which for religious justices, which again is almost all of them, is correlated with their faith traditions. But I use a measure of ideology to put the justices in the same ideological space, not in the same religious space, so that they're aligned along a single left-right continuum like what you see on the top of your screen here. If you've even casually followed the Supreme Court in recent years, you might be led to believe that there's a fight for the very soul of the institution of the Supreme Court, and maybe there is. For more than a decade, former Justice Kennedy was the star of the Supreme Court's show. Any time that there was a contentious case, particularly if it had to do with a social issue like gay marriage or affirmative action, all eyes flew to Kennedy. And so we'd see all of these headlines of, what's Kennedy going to do? Right? We would look at oral argument, and is Anthony Kennedy persuaded? Without Kennedy, the future of gay rights is fragile. If, but this has been, if not in title, this is Kennedy's court. Right? So for the last almost two decades, it had been Kennedy's court. And then when Kennedy stepped down and uh, uh, Brett Kavanaugh was nominated to replace him, suddenly we saw an ideological shift on the court, where this right now is where it looks, <laughs> looks like um, Kavanaugh is ideologically placed, where we um, have Clarence Thomas anchoring the right of the court and Sonia Sotomayor uh, anchoring the left wing of the court. And with Kennedy gone, now Roberts shifts into that key position. And with the death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg last year and the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett, we're not quite sure where Coney Barrett is going to fall ideologically, so I put her where I think she is. Um, <laughs> but we don't, have, we, don't have a good, we don't have a good measure um, for her yet. But we saw lots of splashy headlines with this shift in personnel on the court where suddenly the Chief Justice, now it's actually his court, so before, Chief Justice Roberts had the title, but really it was Kennedy's court. And now because he's shifted into this coveted middle position, this middle ideological position, now the court becomes Roberts' court. And this all boils down to this theory about power and which members of the court hold it. Right? So whose views are we likely to see translated into law? And this has big implications, not just for religious questions that come before the court, but for every case that the Supreme Court hears. And the court hears about 70 cases a term um, with really far-reaching implications. And so understanding which justices on the court are likely to sway the direction of the court, are likely to see their views translated into law, that's the puzzle that I really want to solve. So my central research question that I tease out in a bunch of different ways is to figure out whether or not certain members of the court are better able to influence the legal policy in the court's published opinion. That is, I want to know who influences, right? So are some justices, when they ask for changes in opinions, are they more likely to get their way? And are some justices more likely to be influenced than others because they're trying to keep the, the court's opinion together? So, those are the, the two uh, competing questions that I'm going to fly through just so that we can open this up to, to discussion. But that's the crux of what my research is. And there are lots of competing theoretical claims about which justices are more or less likely to have their views translated into actual law. And I want to give you a really, really quick crash course of how the process works, because I know that not all of you are Supreme Court um, followers or know a lot about how the Supreme Court operates. But the Supreme Court hears oral arguments, and oral arguments are public, even though they're not televised. We do have transcripts, and we have the audio recording of those oral arguments. And after oral arguments, the justices go back into their private conference. And they, it's just the nine sitting justices on the court. Their law clerks are not allowed into the room. They sit around their conference table, this nice depiction of them eating turkey and drinking wine. They don't usually do that, but they do often have meals and food. And the most junior justice on the court is charged with being the gatekeeper. Like, no one is allowed to leave the room. No one is allowed to enter the room. If there is an interruption, a knock at the door, that most junior justice, so here Amy Coney Barrett has to step out into the hall and close the door behind her and talk to whomever it is and then come back in. So what happens behind those closed doors is a lot of secrecy, right? 
When they talk about the case that they just heard in oral argument and the Chief Justice kicks off discussion and they go around the room and they, they talk about what their initial impressions are. And they cast some preliminary votes in conference to establish the tentative winning and losing or majority and dissenting coalitions. The most senior justice in the majority coalition then assigns the majority opinion the one that's actually going to tell us what public policy is going to be, assigns it to a member of that tentative majority coalition, and then the justices all disperse. And they go back to their private chambers, and they don't talk to each other. They have this really strict norm of silence where it's, they, they don't want to form cabals or cliques, and so they wait for that assigned majority opinion author to circulate an opinion to the court before approaching that author and trying to influence what the author writes and where that legal opinion lies. And once the justices, after that first opinion uh, is circulated though, really all hell breaks loose and everyone is bargaining, right? Everyone jumps in into the, the process and is trying to influence where ultimately public policy is going to lie. In a really neat way for me as a political scientist, they write their stuff down. So they send memos back and forth to one another. Um, and so I can track what justices are asking for and then look to see whether or not those requests from some of those justices make it into the actual final opinion. So there are different theoretical expectations about which justices we would expect to see influence where the final legal policy lies. So when I showed you the, the image of the Kennedy court and then the Roberts court, that is the depiction of the median justice model. And that's the one that perhaps we know most about because that's what we talk about in political punditry. That's what gets picked up in mainstream news media. And this suggests that we're going to see the court collapse to the ideological center of the court, right? So we would see that Kennedy is the most influential or that Roberts is the most influential. And intuitively, this sort of makes sense because if you have a nine-person court, you're going to want to maintain a majority coalition. And so that person who occupies the center of the court in a nine-person court is the one that's going to hold all the cards. But there's good reason to believe that maybe uh, we put too much emphasis on the median member of the court. That really those voting coalitions on who wins and who loses a case that comes before the, the court, that those are actually really stable coalitions. So even though they're tentative after conference and justices can, switch their vote if they so choose, and there is some evidence of, of vote fluidity on the court, mostly the justices have a gut sense of whether or not to affirm or reverse the lower court's decision. And so building on that median justice model, uh, some scholars, of which I am one of them, <laughs> propose that there is an alternate a model of decision making where the median member of the majority coalition is actually the most influential. That we have basically two separate cabals and we're just trying to hold the majority together and so we're going to see that majority collapse to the middle member of that winning coalition. That's important because it suggests that if we're collapsing to the median member of majority coalitions, we're going to see more ideologically extreme opinions than collapsing to the ideological center of the court. And we have a very polarized court, the center isn't very center anyway, right? And then there are a couple of other theories that suggest that really the author holds all of the cards and it doesn't matter where they are ideologically situated on the court, they're going to have the most influence. Um, and then there's other scholars that say, well, really the author has primary influence, but there's some legal complexity that allows other justices to have some say sometimes in some conditions, right? So there's lots, lots of theory here, but my goal in my research is to figure out really what happens. And a lot of research before I came along and started my work studied voting behavior and not actually opinion content. And I'm very interested in what the opinion content is, what the legal rules are. And so I... Uh, created a new data set by spending way too many months in the basement of the Library of Congress in the manuscript reading room documenting all of the memos and all of the opinions that the justices sent back and forth from the time that conference ended to the time that the opinion was released to the public. And then, and still, I'm tracking what those changes are. 
and how those changes occur. And so to do this, I first had to take my hundreds of thousands of images and convert them into uh, to text files so that I could read them and automate some of this process a little bit. So I uh, converted my JPEG images from the basement of the Library of Congress into searchable text files using OCR software. So it looks like this, right? Like here's an example of my picture and here's what my computer using optical character recognition software spits out for me. That's nice because now I can just do a text search of, of this. There some things that I have to go through and clean up because it, some of the text doesn't translate very well. But then I want to see how the opinion changes, right? Like Because I want to see if some justices are influencing that opinion from the time that it was first introduced. And so I use plagiarism software in reverse to track where those changes happen. So instead of what maybe, I don't know if you guys do this in your classes, but I often run stu student papers through plagiarism software. Um, maybe that says something about me. But I look for the, the text that's highlighted in red, right? Like, so that's usually that shows that this is, is text that appeared somewhere else. Here, what I'm most interested in is, is the text that appears in black, because that's what's different from one draft to another. And you certainly should not try to read what's on, on the board here. But so I'm trying to determine that overlap so that then I can match the changes in opinions with the requests that are made in the memos to see which justices are actually influencing the change, right? So I look at those um, look at those drafts, I look at a memo, this is an example of a memo, and I identify where a justice is requesting a change, and then in the next draft, sure enough, that populates into the opinion and I can say, okay, so in this case where Rehnquist is writing the opinion, Stevens asked him to make a change, and Rehnquist made that change. There's, the, there's a win, right? So I do this for all of the cases um, during the Burger Court era, and I can chart which justices accommodate which justices at what frequency across the board for 16 years across all of those cases. And what I find is a hot mess, right? So you can, you can, if I'm looking at the authors on my x-axis and the justices that are requesting change on the y-axis, um, what this chart and is, I will tell you it's going to look confusing to you. Um, but what I did was shade like the rate of accommodation. So the darker the square, the higher the, the rate of accommodation on the court. So if it's white, there's no accommodation, which makes sense. Like if you're looking at Lewis Powell, it's white because he doesn't accommodate himself, right? But the darker it gets, the higher the rate of, I feel like I knocked this around, um, the higher the rate of accommodation. And I arranged the, the justices that you see here in ideological order. And so if we were going to see a collapse to the center, we should see a lot of black in the very center of the screen. And we don't, right? So if you start to look at where the, the patterns of black are, they're out in the ideological wings. That suggests to me that there is some preliminary evidence that the median members of the majority coalition are the ones that are more likely to be accommodated by their colleagues. And indeed, throwing it into a logistic regression model, that is what I find, that when, a, the, when the bargainer is the median member of the majority coalition, they are more likely to be accommodated than anyone else. There's an exception to that, though, that when the median justice of the court is the one who authors the opinion, that justice just doesn't accommodate. So that justice recognizes, right? So when Kennedy writes the opinion, Kennedy's like, oh, I've got this, right? I don't have to listen to anyone else. And similarly, when Roberts writes the opinion, Robert Stow says, oh, I've got this. I don't really have to listen to anyone else, right? And we see this decline in the rate um, that the author accommodates their colleagues. So that's a really quick and dirty introduction to what I do. And I think that this matters because I'm finding evidence that there are that there's, there's evidence for, for two, right? Both of these, these different theoretical conjunctures. And so I'm speaking into the literature that exists. But it suggests, right, that, that we're likely to see those opinions in the ideological wings. And so when we're thinking about, again, this Christian conception of justice, and the fact that the court speaks to both retributive, like criminal justice, and restorative justice in terms of social justice and 
and distributive or redistributive justice, like the scope is really, really big. And so for us as Christians to understand where the likely legal outcomes are going to be and why we're going to get there, I think is of utmost importance. All right, I'm going to end, I promise, so that we have a, a few minutes for discussion here. Um, but I think that that I want to highlight a couple of patterns on the, the current court. Um, because in the current era, I think it's very easy to conflate Christianity with a particular party or a particular judicial outcome in no small parts because of the rise of the religious right in shaping the Republican Party and because of the marked uh, rightward trend of the United States Supreme Court. A lot of political science research points to evidence that this manifests in, that religion manifests in voting behavior of judges and justices at all levels of the judiciary. Going back two decades now, um, there's good scholarship on looking at state Supreme Court um, justices finding that state Supreme Court justices who identify as evangelical or part of, of mainstream Protestant organizations are more likely to support the death penalty, are more hostile to gender discrimination cases, are, are more hostile to obscenity, um, and, and less likely to support, um, to, so, to support any kind of, of, of obscenity cases. Um, so we see that there are patterns among religious traditions, especially if we're looking at the lower courts, um, but if we're looking at the high court, right, we're also seeing really notable patterns. Where I started the talk today, um, that the Roberts Court, right, uh, Chief Justice Roberts assumed the, the seat in 2005. And so since 2005, for the last 15 years, the Roberts Court has sided with uh, religious organizations 81% of the time, where again, the vast majority of organizations uh, are Christian organizations. Um, the Roberts Court has weakened the Establishment Clause, adopting the pointing to Kennedy's influence here, adopting Kennedy's preferred co coercion theory of establishment, that establishment means that government would force you to adopt religion, and so as long as government is not forcing anyone to adopt a religion, then that is not establishment of, of religion, and so the establishment clause hasn't been violated. Um, the Roberts Court has strengthened the free exercise clause, which benefits for sure the religious groups that are coming before the Supreme Court, but conceivably could also strengthen the rights of minority religious groups as well. That just remains to be seen whether it actually plays out that way. Um, but my research speaks broadly to those questions because I'm looking at the behind the scenes of how we get to the legal policy that actually influences what we actually see, right? And so when we're looking at those personnel changes, I can predict where we're going to see doctrinal shifts. And so when you add a, a Brett Kavanaugh and an Amy Coney Barrett, this trend, right, so this trend is going back to, to 2005, I expect is likely to continue and strengthen, right? That, that I would expect that cases, um, particularly free exercise cases, are going to find a lot of favorability with the courts. And it would be neat if we stopped there Right? in judging the justices by some Christian standard of saying, look, the, the justices are doing right, at least by Christians, in upholding free exercise um, for Christian organizations. But remember that the Christian call to justice is to defend the cause of the weak, of the fatherless, to maintain the rights of the poor and the oppressed, to rescue the weak and the needy. And in that regard, the Supreme Court historically, and still now, continues to be, in my estimation, an abysmal failure. That the court has historically and continues to favor the wealthy over the poor, to maintain corporate interests and expand corporate rights at the expense of individuals. The Supreme Court has provided a very hollow hope historically for groups that have been marginalized and left out without social and political power in American society. So is the biblical standard the right standard by which to judge the justices? I sat in my office for, I don't know, like months trying to answer that question. And I don't think I have an answer to that question. I can answer it personally, but as a political scientist, this puts me in a really uncomfortable spot. And I don't think that I have a nice tidy bow to end the, the talk. That 
in my reading of scripture, the justices aren't doing a good job. In my reading of the Constitution, they're not doing a very good job. Right? And so maybe, to return to the title of the court, we need to ask God to save the court. And maybe a real radical revisionist Christian court would answer that call to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And that's where I will leave it. I think I unmuted you. Oh. Try it. Nope. Hand. <laughs> Panta- oh, sorry. <laughs> there I am. Hi. Hi. Okay. Yep. What questions do you have? Uh, comments? Thoughts? Yeah. Uh, at, at, at the beginning, you were talking about the, you know, the First Amendment, the free exercise clause, often uh, provides protection for religious minorities. Or Mm-hmm. Roberts, and you're expecting a strengthening of the free exercise clause. So that I'm just trying to square that with the idea that the court has not been uh, helping or uh, supporting the interests of marginalized folks. But the it's free exercise clause seems like that it would be doing. That, that's a really great question. So I think that's the part that remains to be seen. So. Part of the way that I think that Christian groups have done a really good job at winning at the court is pretending that they're marginalized, right? So the story um, in American politics, American politics seems to be that Christianity is under attack, right? And that is the argument that we see made before the court. And you would think that by listening to oral arguments that Christians are actively persecuted by the American government, right? That Christianity is the marginalized group. It's not, right? Like that is just fundamentally not true. It is a majority. It's a majority everywhere. It's a majority among our political elites. It's a majority on the court. Everywhere it's a majority. Like That persecution narrative isn't real. But by giving that the value of saying it is real, right? it bolsters protections for that majority religious group when the free exercise clause was to protect the minority interests. Right? We're just not seeing cases from minority religious groups making it onto the Supreme Court docket. They exist. The Supreme Court's just not hearing them. And so the, the question then is whether the principles, the legal rule that is articulated in the opinions, then also serves to protect the rights of minority religious groups. And I, I don't think that we have enough data. Like conceptually, yes, it could, right? Like a ruling in favor of any religious group should be a ruling in favor of all religious groups or non-religious groups. I just don't think that it plays out that way. Could I ask a question that's beyond the scope of kind of what you were talking about? So yes, feel free please. to dismiss me, mm-hmm. but you know more than I do about all of this. Um, what about what stops those minority cases from making it to the Supreme Court? The justices docket. of the Supreme right. Court make them. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, that's what I thought. Yeah. So there are about nine thousand cases that are appealed to the Supreme Court every term. The Supreme Court hears seventy. Um, in a good year, two of those are going to be religious liberty um, sorts of cases. Um, there are definitely more than that that are uh, appealed to the Supreme Court. Um, to get onto the Supreme Court's docket, four of the justices have to agree to, to hear the case. So you have to have a large minority of the justices want to take the case. Um, and I think that there's a lack of, of political will um, for justices to step into this. When it comes to the Establishment Clause, historically, the Supreme Court has been at odds with public opinion, and so they just stopped hearing those cases. Um, and in Establishment uh, Clause cases, the so like the Roberts Court is siding with religious organizations m- much more so in free exercise cases than in establishment cases. 
Um, so if we're looking, I think with establishment cases, the Roberts Court is siding with religious organizations like 54% of the time. Um, so that also like shows what that, that shift is. And we just don't see as many um, because the justices don't want to do it. They lack that legitimacy. The Supreme Court in, the, in 1964 um, uh, banned prayer in public schools. I went to a school where prayer was routinely <laughs> exercised uh, and, and continues. Um, uh, like we see prayer in public schools in rural communities and across the South. And so there's like that widespread defiance to Supreme Court rulings where the Supreme Court just doesn't want to wade into it. I saw, you want to go to Steve? Okay, Steve. Uh, so your, your conclusion in the end is a little bit mysterious to me. So let me mm -hmm. try to explain why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's but it's but it's first uh, like it has its severe limits in that based on the laws that are created. Right. So um, could you couldn't you say alternatively that the Supreme Court is has their hands tied by a Congress that's unwilling to do justice, and that the Supreme Court is then maybe doing justice in following that, but in, in enforcing and interpreting laws that don't follow the standards, or is there? Say so that last part of your question again. So, I mean, is your is your is your conclusion that the Supreme Court is not doing justice, or the court's not doing justice, a statement about the courts making unjust decisions within their latitude that is clearly within the written law, or is your complaint that they're not overturning unjust decisions? Both. Okay. So, I, so I think that that. In my area of expertise, I know a lot about civil rights law, right? And so looking historically at civil rights law, particularly on the treatment of people of color, the Supreme Court has very consistently read the Constitution in a narrow way to uphold laws that have discriminatory impacts that lead to systematic inequality. It would have happened without the court. Right? Like we can point to Plessy versus Ferguson where the Supreme Court codifies separate but equal under the 14th Amendment and doesn't overturn it for 60 years. It would have happened without the court anyway. But I think because then that became the constitutional rule, it became so much harder to undo. And it contributed to this expansion outside of Jim Crow South into practices in the North that contributed to more and more segregation. And so I think that there are both unjust practices that the court upholds under that they constitutionally and biblically should overturn, uh, and that they uphold those things, allowing for the perpetration of injustice in a way that doesn't square well with me. But I think that like the Constitution for me, but I don't even know if I should say this out loud, I'm being recorded, but like, I feel like we should just scrap the Constitution, right? Like the, the Constitution is so fundamentally flawed that the justices can hide behind the veneer of law of saying, we're going to uphold this really, really crappy law. We know it's a bad law. We know it's going to lead to unjust outcomes, but we're going to uphold it because the 14th Amendment says no state shall do this and the federal government is doing it, right? And like those sorts of, of legal veneer are things that bother me. We have room for w one more because there is a class coming in here. Annie, I know you had your hand up, so. So Rachel, if, if you for a second would start your talk at when you ended, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, is, that is a million dollar question. Um, I honestly don't know. Uh, and, and that's look, it's something that I wish that I knew. Um, and you know, in being part of this continuum group and thinking about like my faith and scholarship in a way that I had never thought about my faith and my scholarship before, right? Like I, I think I can come to normative conclusions about my judgments of the court. But I also don't know that my normative judgments are the of the court are the way that we ought to remake the court. Um, 
I, I would like to think that I have that wisdom, right? <laughs> that, that I know better, um, but I, that would be a tremendous lack of humility, uh, and, I, and I don't. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I could start the talk that way, and I, maybe that's where my research will go next, once I get tenure. <laughs> would you join me in thanking Dr. Scott, please? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming, everyone.